Welcome to this month's lunchtime lecture series. These are presented each month by the Interior Museum. We're original to this building and we interpret the history of our many bureaus at the Department of the Interior. And this month I am very happy to be presenting Carol Shively from the National Park Service. So focusing on some of the publications and, and different uh, events that are being used to highlight the um, sesquicentennial of the Civil War. So Carol Shively is the Civil War sesquicentennial uh, communications coordinator of the Southeast region. I think you probably have the longest title of anyone <laughs> I've had to um, introduce. And um, November of 2011, they, um, they produced this publication, Hispanics in the Civil War, as part of a larger series. Um, I believe three publications altogether uh, will be the result, focusing on kind of the broader perspectives of the Civil War, talking about uh, different histories that aren't commonly um, heard, aren't commonly shared, and aren't commonly interpreted along with the Civil War. So very excited to um, have, have this talk and hopefully maybe some others will, will come about due to these publications. I will um, pass the microphone to, to Carol. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us. Well, thank you, Diana. The, um, it took me the first month to be able to pronounce the word sesquicentennial. <laughs> and then, then it got easier from there. But um, thank you all for coming. And on behalf of the National Park Service, um, appreciate you. Your interest in this program on Hispanics and the Civil War. I was delighted when Diana asked us to be a part of the Interior Museum's lecture series because we're really excited about this publication. It's personally broadened my own perspectives a lot and I'm hope, hoping it will do so for others as well. And the topic is especially appropriate, of course, during Hispanic Heritage Month. And it's an honor to be here in this room named for one of my great heroes, Rachel Carson. And Diana asked me to tell you a little bit about how this publication came about. And every year, the National Steering Committee for the Civil War sesquicentennial gets together face to face. And two years ago, that was at Manassas. And you know how it is at lunch. Everybody goes the ways of the wind to try to find some place to eat. And Don Wallenhop, the chief of interpretation for the Southeast region, and I found that culinary bastion of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we found our regional director, David Bella, there as well. And he invited us over to his table. And just previously at the meeting, we'd been talking about how a really important part of our vision for the sesquicentennial, as Diana alluded to, uh, was to tell the little or lesser known stories of the Civil War and the home front. And David started asking us about you know, the contributions that various ethnic groups had made to the war, and if we knew anything about them. And we really didn't. Um, but Don suggested that we could find out, and that we could perhaps do a, a publication or a poster series on them. And we'd already completed um, our first publication on slavery as the cause of the Civil War, which talks about the African American experience. And we decided to take it from there. Uh, starting with the Hispanic contribution, and the next will be the American Indian, and we're not sure where we'll go from there, perhaps Asian, and then the European immigrants as well. So many stories to tell. But it really is a little known story about the Hispanic contribution to the Civil War, but fortunately for us, there are a number of people in the National Park Service who know quite a bit about it. So we assembled a, a service-wide committee to work on this project, and I just wanted to mention their names. And these are the experts. Um, Ted Alexander is the historian at Antietam, and he had done the research on the Hispanic contribution in the North and the South. Dr. Joseph Sanchez, the director of the Spanish Colonial Research Center in New Mexico, and the superintendent at Petroglyph, and Bob Spooty from our Intermountain Regional Office uh, did the research on the Hispanic contribution in the West. And we also consulted all of our 120 uh, plus Civil War to Civil Rights sites about any park specific stories that they might want to include. We had some interpreters on the committee, uh, Marie Frias, formerly the superintendent at Fort Union, Melissa Perez, education specialist at Vicksburg, 
and Doug Murphy, the Chief of Interpretation at Palo Alto Battlefield. And as interpreters, it was our job to combine the historian's narratives and meld them and mold them into one voice that was accessible to the public. And when we had that in hand, we, we took the manuscript and we had it reviewed by Dr. Jerry Thompson from Texas A&M University, who is probably the preeminent authority on this topic. Then I went on to find images for the piece and work with the designer to actually produce it. Um, Eastern National, our cooperating association, prints and distributes it for us. It's available for purchase in, in many uh, park visitor centers and on Eastern's website. And you can also find it on the National Park Service website. So all that by way of saying I'm not an historian, so I'm not an expert on this. I'm the project manager. Uh, I'm, I'm the messenger, but a, a very proud messenger. Because when the book finally came out, I saw what kind of impact it was having on people. Uh, when our regional director, David Vela, finally got it in hand, he sat there and he just looked at it for a while and he said, I've been waiting 30 years for this. I'm going to buy it for my kids for Christmas and I'm going to read it to my grandchildren. He was just so gratified to finally have the story of his people told. And when I was at the 150th anniversary event for Shiloh, I had a similar experience. We were at the um, gala premiere of the New Park film, and <coughs> most everyone else was wearing either evening gowns or suits or reenactor uniforms. And I think I may have been the only one in uniform there. And the, uh, the members of the general public were also there. And I saw this woman kind of working her way through the crowded room uh, to get to me because she wanted to talk to someone from the National Park Service. And she comes up and she's holding up the book and she's saying, a park ranger at one of the battlefields gave this to me. Have you seen it yet? And it was just this remarkable coincidence that I happened to be the project manager. And I said, well, yes, I have. Uh, I have seen it. And uh, I'm delighted that it's meaningful to you. And it was, she kept holding up. She kept holding up. And she said, you know, I have been visiting Civil War battlefields for 40 years with my husband, and I've enjoyed that. But she said, now, now, I can use this as a guidebook to go around to the different battlefields and find out where my people fought and died for this country. So that was a really moving moment for me. But then I started thinking, what's wrong with this picture? How is it that these two people, born and raised in this country, educated in our school system, with college degrees, and a passion for their Latino culture, until now had no idea about the role their ancestors played in this war? How is it that this story has remained the purvey of a few historians? So we set out to change that. We devised an outreach effort in which we gave 100 of these books and 1,000 posters to each of our 120 Civil War civil rights sites that were interested uh, to distribute to schools in the area at the grade level at which the Civil War is taught and also to Hispanic community organizations. So we hope that now, even at the most casual glance, in a school classroom or in a community hall, Hispanic kids and all kids will see those images and, and come to know that their ancestors made a significant contribution at this defining moment in our nation's history. That's why we wrote the book for the general public, rather than at an academic level, so teachers could use it in their classrooms. And I would just say that the posters here are not a sales item. We just use them for outreach, but I brought some here. They're both in English and in Spanish, so if you're interested, you're welcome to take one, or if you know of anyone who teaches or anyone who might be able to, to post it, um, you're welcome to take some of these. Fifty years ago, at the 100th anniversary of the Civil War, the Park Service and other organizations were pretty roundly criticized uh, for only telling the same story from the same perspective to the same people. And because of this, there, there are fears that 
uh, our Civil War parks are becoming irrelevant to the public at large. And if so, we will have done this to ourselves because that's how we've interpreted the war for all these years. So we're not going to let that happen again. It's all about relevance, making this story relevant to all Americans. That's the first principle of interpretation for you interpreters out there. Over two, two years ago, before I came on board, people who are a lot smarter than me got together and wrote a vision for the sesquicentennial. And in it, they wrote, the National Park Service has a great opportunity to touch millions of Americans, including those who, with a little help, can find meaning where they thought there was none. They can find meaning where they thought there was none. I was one of those people, I'll admit, when they hired me in this position, I wasn't all that interested in the Civil War because I thought it was all about troop movements and battle tactics. Come to find out it's about a lot more than that. So I'd like to tell you some of those stories now and, and see if you can find some meaning in them. I'm just going to take you on a little walk through the book. And let's see what we find. When the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in 1861, igniting the Civil War, Hispanic people lived in all parts of the country. Like all Americans, they had a decision to make, which side to choose. They responded to a variety of motives, public and private, and they represented all socioeconomic levels from wealthy aristocrats fighting to preserve a way of life to impoverished laborers seeking to improve their fortunes. Patriotism, personal gain, regional conditions, and history all played a role in their decisions. But by the close of the war, 20,000 Hispanic soldiers had fought in this bloody conflict, and thousands of Hispanic civilians had lent hearts and hands on the home front. Some held a stake in the issue of slavery on one side or the other. Hispanics of wealth and position, like you see here, tended to serve as officers. Those of moderate or lesser means tended to enlist to improve their way of life or even to escape indentured servitude themselves. When I was a kid in school, I learned that the first permanent European settlement in North America was established by the English at Jamestown, Virginia. Does that sound familiar to anyone? When really, it was the Spanish who established the first permanent settlement at St. Augustine, Florida, over 40 years earlier. I guess it all depends on who writes the history books. The arrival of Columbus in 1492 opened a floodgate of European explorers and imperialists from Spain and other countries, De Soto in the southeast, Coronado and Cabrillo in the southwest. To frame the picture for you, when the American colonies were proudly declaring their independence from England on the 4th of July in 1776, the Spanish were celebrating the founding of their new city on the other side of the continent. They called it San Francisco. Imperial rivalries and the emergence of the United States of America would carve a way at the Spanish Empire. By the mid-1800s, most of the Spanish lands were gone, now occupied as states and, and territories of the US. But strong Hispanic populations remained, particularly in the Southeast and the Southwest. And these citizens were swept into the conflict that split the nation in 1861. Now, as I mentioned, Hispanic people had been in the Southeast for so long, they were well established in the area. They built the economy. They were the landed aristocracy. And I'm, I'm going to break away from the story just for a moment to make this point a little stronger. When we gave these books to parks to distribute, Gail Bishop, the chief of interpretation at Gulf Islands, sent one to, um, among other organizations, a group named El Pueblo. And their executive director sent us a letter that really surprised me, and I'd like to read a few sentences from it. She said, the mission of the village El Pueblo is to be a force for justice and compassion 
toward the Hispanic community of the Gulf Coast. The National Park Service's publication and poster have been a tremendous teaching tool for us as we educate school and community groups about the Hispanic community in order to encourage tolerance and understanding. They help us dismiss the prevalent attitude that Hispanics are outsiders without a right to make this their home. Any publication that helps tackle prejudice toward Hispanics and address the community's role in our nation's history will benefit the community at large. You know, I knew this little book was gonna have impact, but I never really envisioned that. But back to our story. Hispanic people in the Southeast were affluent plantation owners and merchants. Some held slaves. They were Southerners, and they would fight to preserve that way of life. 800 of the native sons of Louisiana formed a home guard to protect the city of New Orleans. Hispanic soldiers known as the Louisiana Tigers and another unit from Florida fought with Robert E. Lee at Antietam and Gettysburg. Hispanic men from Alabama fought at Vicksburg, Atlanta, and Nashville. And as it turns out, not all the soldiers were men. Take, for example, Loretta Jeanetta Velazquez. When her husband went off to fight as an officer in the Confederacy, she wanted to fight with him. Concern for her safety and thinking the battlefield not a, no place for a woman particularly of her high standing, he dismissed the idea outright. And then he went off to war. Loretta did what any good wife should. She waited for a while. And then she went anyway. She disguised herself as Lieutenant Harry Buford. You see her picture over there, both as Loretta and as Lieutenant Buford. And she fought in a number of battles, including Manassas and Shiloh. Uh, and she later wrote a book on her memoirs telling that story. And there's a documentary film coming out uh, on her life next month. And um, we hope to premiere that here. And stay tuned. Turns out she wasn't the only one. We know now that there were between 400 and 2,000 women who served in this fashion. Some were discovered, of course, when they were injured and being treated for injuries. Uh, but others went undetected for the whole war. Some received military pensions after the war. And some are buried in our national cemeteries. And of course, not all Hispanics lived in the South. Northern states also had significant Hispanic communities, particularly around the large cities. Just like today, immigrants who sought to integrate themselves into our society and into the society of their new homeland understood that serving their country in uniform was probably the quickest way to become an American. Puerto Rican Lieutenant Augusto Rodriguez protected the Union capital and courageously led his men in battle at Fredericksburg. To break the horrible stalemate at the siege of Petersburg, Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasance of Argentinian descent devised a plan to dig a tunnel or a mine, imagine this, 500 feet long underneath the Confederate line and then blow it up in the now famous Battle of the Crater. His ingenuity earned him the rank of Brevet Brigadier General. And then there's this man. Lieutenant Joseph de Castro. De Castro was the flag bearer for the 19th Massachusetts Infantry. He fought at Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg. In the heat of the battle, de Castro charged forward and captured the enemy flag. Then he broke through the lines, presented it to his commanding officer, and without a word, ran back into the fight. For his bravery, he was awarded the Medal of Honor at one of the most iconic moments in one of the most iconic battles of the war. He was the first Hispanic soldier to receive the nation's highest military honor. But he wouldn't be the last. Many would follow, some very soon. For example, example Captain Luis Emilio helped lead the heroic charge on Fort Wagner by the now famous African-American unit, the 54th Massachusetts. 
He later published a book about their accomplishments, which he entitled Brave Black Regiment. Hispanic soldiers fought on land and sea on both sides of the conflict. Navy officer Michael Lucina was the daring captain of a Confederate blockade runner trying to break the Union blockade of supplies and material that was starving the South. On the other side, Juan Ortega fought equally hard to maintain that blockade. Philip Bazar from Chile was one of only six men to breach the daunting Confederate earthworks you see here during the assault of Fort Fisher in North Carolina. Both Ortega and Bazar were awarded the, the Medal of Honor for their conspicuous bravery while engaged in an action against an enemy of the United States. And then, of course, there's this man, perhaps the most celebrated naval officer of all time, Admiral David Farragut. Maybe you know the name. There's a statue in a square name for him not far from here. He's probably best known for climbing high in the rigging of his ship during the Battle of Mobile Bay. And despite the concerns and cautions of his men about mines, he famously shouted what is commonly paraphrased as, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And here, I'd like to underline the vital role that immigrants have played in the war. Here are two officers who fought together to liberate their homeland of Cuba, but ended up on opposite sides of this American struggle. A dynamic leader and engineer with a fierce hatred for slavery, Lieutenant Colonel Federico Cavada quickly rose to the ranks, commanding infantry units at Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, where he was finally captured and imprisoned. While in prison, as you can see here, he drew detailed drawings of prison life, which he smuggled out of the prison on pieces of newspaper and later published as a book. And he gave the proceeds of this book to widows and orphans of fellow prisoners. In this drawing, he dreams of freedom and returning home to his family. On the other side, Colonel Ambrosio Gonzalez masterminded the bombardment at Fort Sumter that started the war and later designed a system of forts to defend the coast all the way from Charleston, South Carolina to Savannah, Georgia. You know, we tend to think of the Civil War as an epic clash between North and South, but part of the war took place west of the Mississippi as well. It's here where the the majority of Hispanic soldiers fought due to their high percentage in the population at large. Now, if you'll recall, after the war with Mexico in 1848, the U.S. acquired vast portions of what was northern Mexico, much of Texas, California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The 100,000 Mexicans who lived there suddenly, with a stroke of a pen, became Americans. Just 15 years later, the Civil War broke out, and they, too, were forced to take sides. Slavery was illegal in Mexico, so many Mexican-Americans opposed it. But some wealthy Hispanic, as well as white ranchers and farmers, depended on the coerced labor of American Indians. Other Hispanics were still bitter about their loss in the Mexican War. Loyalties were split. New Mexico became the lightning rod. Now you might wonder what the Confederacy wanted in the West when this was primarily a battle between North and South. Well, the Union naval blockade had stopped ships from coming or going from the port cities of the South. They could neither send exports nor receive critical supplies. The Union blockade was starving the Confederacy. So they looked to the port cities of California and the riches of the gold rush there. When Union forces in the West left to fight the war in the East, 
the Confederacy took full advantage of the situation, sweeping in and claiming Arizona and New Mexico as Confederate territory. To get California, they first needed to get New Mexico. But the Union Territorial Governor Henry Connolly sounded the alarm. Citizens of New Mexico, your territory has been invaded. The integrity of your soil attacked. The property of peaceful and industrious citizens destroyed. I hereby order the immediate organization of a militia. Hispanic men from New Mexico rallied to the call, mustering into service at Fort Union. These reenactors here honor their ancestors who actually fought with this unit during the war. Well, now you have probably heard of Kit Carson, but have you heard of Captain Rafael Chacon or Lieutenant Colonel J. Francisco Chavez? You see, that's the problem. That's the problem. Chacon led the New Mexico units in 22 battles. Chavez fought side by side with Kit Carson, sharing leadership of the unit. He would be elected to Congress a few years later, but no one knows these names today. Again, it's all about who writes the history books, isn't it? This ignorance has to end right here and right now. Their Union troops fought valiantly, but Confederates prevailed at the battles of Valverde and Picacho Pass. The turning point would come at a place called Glorieta Pass. The fierce battle swayed back and forth with neither force gaining advantage until this man on the right here, Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Chavez, guided Union forces to the Confederate supply train and then destroyed it. With no few food and ammunition, the Confederates were forced to abandon the field and the entire territory. The Battle of Glorieta is often called the Gettysburg of the West because it was the high water mark of the Confederacy west of the Mississippi and the beginning of the end for the Confederacy in the Southwest. It ended their occupation of New Mexico and dashed their strategy to create a gateway to California. Much of this is due to Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Chavez. So from now on, if you please, when you hear the name Kit Carson, I hope you will also think of Rafael Chacon, J. Francisco Chavez, and most of all, this man, Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Chavez. After the fall of New Mexico, to the Union, the Hispanic troops from California swept in to take Arizona for the Union as well. Now these men, look at that picture there on the right, these men were particularly fearsome in battle. They were one of the few Lancer units in the Union Army fighting with lances, a proud symbol of the Hispanic heritage of California. Well that left Texas. Because of its strategic location, Texas remained critical to the Confederate cause. Well, think about it. Exports from the South loaded onto Mexican flagships could sail freely past the Union blockade without even being questioned. This trade was a lifeline for the Confederacy. Hispanic Texans were split. Some supported the Union and others the Confederacy. Like General Robert E. Lee, Colonel Santos Benavides was offered a Union generalship but turned it down to serve his home state of Texas. Benavides was able to protect the Confederate supply line on several occasions, forcing the Union back across the Rio Grande. Union forces eventually abandoned Texas to fight in the East. But it was too little, too late. On April 9, 1865, Lee surrendered to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. But in those days, news traveled slowly. Unaware that the war had ended, the Confederacy made one last attack on the Union at Palmito Ranch in Texas. They won that battle, but unbeknownst to them, they had already lost the war. 
Well, now this is where most discussions of the Civil War end, but not this one. One of the things that's so often overlooked in the study of war is the heroism and the tragedy on the home front. With men off to war, women filled traditional male roles, managing properties and businesses, working in fields and factories to provide for their families. Nationwide, women made essential contributions to the war effort as well. Northern women worked in factories producing ammunition and uniforms. They formed relief societies, sending aid packages to soldiers and medical supplies to army hospitals. On both sides of the conflict, women played an indispensable role as nurses treating the wounded, even on the dangerous front lines of the war. The only woman ever to this day to win a Medal of Honor was the surgeon, Dr. Mary Walker at uh, Ch Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Still other women served as seamstresses and laundresses in camp. Uh, later, many other women served as aid workers and teachers to help the millions of people fleeing enslavement and later advocating for them politically after the war. Well, some of this was true in the old Spanish Southwest, but there was a slightly different saga here, and we chose to tell the story um, through the eyes of the people in the small town of Socorro, New Mexico, who just happened to get caught in the crossfire. The planting season had just begun when the men from the town were called off to war. The people behind tended the crops as best they could, but managed only a small harvest. The town then fell in the path of Confederate troops. Hungry soldiers pillaged the town, seizing any available food and supplies. Starvation and misery followed. Women became the last line of defense for their families. To me, this picture says it all. I call it the face of war on the home front. While Confederate soldiers held a dance, a fandango, in her home, and then burned it to the ground, Dolores Perea Connolly escaped with little more than her life. And she was one of the lucky ones. Affluent people like she and the family pictured below her could move their families to the homes of friends and family in safer places. Others could not. The family you see on the right, this mother and her children, were virtually defenseless rendered homeless by war. Now we tend to think of the Civil War as freeing enslaved Africans, and it certainly did that. But many Hispanic people also lived under a type of bondage called indentured servitude. This system allowed workers to pay off debts to their masters with their labor, but it could easily become a form of slavery if the repayment of debt proved impossible to overcome. But the 13th Amendment, which freed four million enslaved Africans, also freed those held in indentured servitude. A special clause was put in the bill specifically for that purpose. Nevertheless, Hispanic people did not always receive their promised rights. Ultimately, it was employment, not legislation, that ended this practice. In the 1930s and 40s, Senator Dennis Chavez lured high-paying jobs to New Mexico. Workers were finally able to break the chains of debt, and once and for all, and the system of peonage disappeared forever. In 1938, 83-year-old Manuel Jesus Vasquez spoke of his many years since childhood as a peon without pay. With his master's debt and his freedom from death and his freedom from debt, he recalled that all he wanted to hold was a penny, the first coin he would ever own, one that had Lincoln on the front and the word liberty next to it. Still, 
It wasn't until the civil rights movement of the mid-1900s and the efforts of men like Cesar Chavez to people who suffer from exploitation of farm labor and domestic servitude take another step toward equality. And it's not over yet. There are still obstacles to overcome before all Americans are equal. If the Civil War was the defining moment in the history of the nation, then full citizenship is the defining task of the current generation and those yet to come. More than 20,000 Latino men fought in this war, and as we just found out, some women as well. National battlefield parks from Gettysburg to Vicksburg to Glorietta give silent testimony to their valor. Still more, tens of thousands more, lent hearts and hands on the home front. All merit recognition, not just for the honor they brought upon the Hispanic American community, but for their service and sacrifice as Americans in the nation's greatest struggle, the Civil War. Thank you.